June the 16th is an auspicious day. And there was another auspicious day in June, more than 50 years ago, when a group of people sat around a table in Cliptown and wrote the Freedom Charter. And they wrote those words, the doors of learning and culture shall be opened. And I wonder what they would have thought of opening education in a digitally mediated age in 2012. That's what I'm going to be talking about today. <coughs> There's so many elements to open education, scholarship, open source, licenses, practices, open research. It's overwhelming. <coughs> so I'm only going to focus on two aspects of open education today. Open access, which refers to sharing peer-reviewed academic outputs, mostly research, and open education resources, which is about teaching resources, teaching and learning resources, which might or might not include research. Fundamentally, they are all types of open content. And what defines open content is an open license and the fact that they are free for the user, for everyone to use. All types of resources can be open content. Books, study guides, lectures, TED Talks, such as the ones we're hearing today, textbooks, blogs, etc. And in some ways, there's nothing new about open content and open education. As far back as the 11th century, a seer who developed, um, uh, learned about the therapeutic uh, aspects of plants said, the labors of knowledge must have public benefit. She fought for this. And we all know that education is about sharing and about openness. It's not possible for education to happen or learning to happen without openness and sharing. So what's changed? Why is it such an exciting and interesting opportunity today? There's one massive, disruptive, groundbreaking shift that has really moved us into the next era, and that's the internet. An infrastructure of networks and connectivity which has a center but does not depend on a center. Those nodes allow peer-to-peer -peer connections. And on that infrastructure, which is like a railway line, there is the World Wide Web. And on that World Wide Web, there are at present 550 million websites, all of which offer something to education. And on those websites are files that can be shared and downloaded endlessly and freely. And that is a ground shifter for education. We often say here in South Africa, but we don't have connectivity. Well, actually we do. A few years ago, there was very little in, in terms of connectivity to South Africa. And now there are pipes. This is a, a, a map for 2014. The connectivity is upon us. But perhaps even more important, we are in the top five countries in the world with, in terms of cell phone coverage. In 2010, there were 101 subscriptions for every 100 South Africans. And this is a huge opportunity for inclusivity. Another enabler is the fact that we now live in a network society. One of the great sociologists of our time has actually written about this extensively in the rise of the network society, and he says networks constitute the new, the new social morphology. We live in a networked logic which changes power and culture. And the last important enabler are new legal frameworks, open licenses which are legal 
which enable people to share and enable people to use content legally. The old copyright system is broken. It's not useful anymore in the world that we live in and it's not useful for education. So what are the benefits? What's, what's the point of all this? One can think of openness like sunshine. If you expose content online, you enable growth. And the most obvious way of benefiting education is through access to knowledge for everyone, for scholars, students, policymakers, everyone in civil society. The problem is that many academic resources are locked away in expensive journals and open access is about unlocking that content. We can have a look just for an example at the cost of journals today, typical costs of journals. We look at chemistry, almost 4,000 US dollars for a title. The so-called cheapest journal on that list, music, $300 times 8.4, that's clearly something that even the most prestigious universities can no longer afford. Harvard is saying that they cannot afford these journals any longer. Where does that leave us in South Africa? But having to embrace open content and open alternatives, and fortunately, there is a rise in open access journals. 30% of journals are now open access. There are more than 2,000 plus open access repositories and there are numerous places to find open teaching resources. Openness also enables development. I'll just give you one example in the health sector where clearly doctors need the benefits of the latest research. And one case makes the point. A sleeping sickness test, a robust scientifically sound test was developed by scientists in Australia and they decided to make that test available in an open access journal in the public library of science and by doing so they saved lives. Open access really can save lives. Openness also enables participation. At the moment we are consumers of knowledge from de developed countries. This map represents book publishing. It's quite shocking to see Africa as that little deflated balloon. One of the reasons book publishing is in that condition is not because we don't have anything to say, but because it's expensive and it's difficult. But as I mentioned, networked societies are more participatory and those conventional north-south relationships can be replaced with new kinds of relationships. A look at Wikipedia, which is the sixth most popular website in the world, shows that we are already participating in putting our content and our information online. As you can see from this representation, at least from Southern Africa and Northern Africa. Openness also enables innovation. Studies from Denmark and the UK have shown the value of open content and open access to the private sector. How much more important would this be for South Africa with our move towards small and medium enterprises and our crisis of unemployment? And open access and open content is very good news for academics. Academics, we don't work in universities for the money. We work in universities because we want to make a difference, we want to contribute, we want to influence, and we want to make an impact. And the way that impact is measured in academia is through citations and open access increases citations by up to 600%. So business as usual is dead. It's over. There is a rising tide globally. In the UK, the Minister of Science and Technology has announced that from now on, academic research will be made free of charge to readers and the European Union is going the same way. Which leaves us where? What do we need to be doing? 
We all need to become open scholars and open educators. We have to engage with open education. Critical literacies and information literacies are more important than they've ever been before. We should all be creating open resources. Every single one of us here, every single one of us listening has something to contribute. And we should all be finding open resources, learning how to find them, where to find them. We should be thinking about freeing the textbooks, creating open textbooks. I know the criticism is we don't have the technology. Well, if Uruguay can give every child in schools a laptop, why can't we give every child in school a, a tablet filled with resources? And lastly, we need to legislate for open content with public funds. If it's funded with public money, everyone has the right to access it. The Green Paper and the Distance Education Frameworks are already supporting open access. Our Minister of Science and Technology, Technology is aware that information and knowledge are valuable and generally not free online. And she says the Department of Science and Technology supports open access. But let's ensure that that is legislated and that that comes to pass in South Africa. Because if we do, we can push those doors open and we in South Africa will have the world at our feet. Thank you.